All right. So welcome back to Unite. Uh, y'all like holiday breaks? Is anyone on Thanksgiving break right now? All right. Does anyone have to go to school tomorrow? Oh, losers. <laughs> yeah, and uh, hey, Merry Christmas, right? It's, it's Christmas. Yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, I know it's, it's still, it's actually Thanksgiving week, right? Um, and, and some of y'all are haters uh, that, uh, you know, we can't start Christmas until Thanksgiving. But because of some scheduling things, uh, we are starting our Christmas celebration tonight. Um, and I love the Christmas season. Y'all love the Christmas season? Yeah. Yeah, I love, uh, I love the decorations. I was putting my decorations up uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's, it's never a good sign when... Uh, you start sweating, putting up the Christmas decorations, but we live in, we live in uh, South Carolina. Uh, I love the decorations. I love the presents. Uh, I love the family, the food, every part of it, right? Y'all know who else likes holidays? God, <laughs> right? So in the Bible, God actually institutes up here. Yeah, uh, over 10 uh, holidays that he actually commands the Israelites uh, to follow. And I'm not going to talk about all of them. Um, but uh, God loves holidays, right? Many of these holidays lasted for 10 days or eight, over a week. We only get like one day usually for a holiday. But So God is really into holidays because of how important they are for helping us to remember things. And each of these holidays uh, had a specific time that God had done something for the Israelites that he wanted them to remember. So that's another reason why I love that we get to take this time heading up to Christmas with this series of messages that focus us in on the real importance of this Christmas season, because with all the stuff that goes on, all the fun stuff, the good stuff that surrounds Christmas, I think we can often lose track of what it is that we're actually celebrating at Christmas, right? So tonight we start this new series that we're calling God's Promises, uh, where we're going to look at God's promises related to the birth of His Son. And tonight we're starting with looking at what God promised to a guy named Zechariah. So let's jump right into that and look at what the promise was. So I'm reading from Luke, starting about verse 5. It says this, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Right, so here we get this introduction to the major person we're going to focus on tonight, Zechariah. And we get a lot of uh, good background information on who he is, right? First off, we see that he's a priest, Right? So that means that he was a Jew from the special tribe of Levi, um, and also that he was a direct descendant of Aaron, who was the brother of Moses. You all remember Moses from our End of the Promised Land series? God set up Aaron and all of his direct descendants to be priests that were going to be in charge of administering all of the laws for worship in the temple which dealt with the various sacrifices that would roll back the sins of the people until the Messiah would come. Then next we're, getting, we're given this timeline about where we're at, right? This was during the rule of King Herod, which would mean this is somewhere around 5 or 6 B.C., right? And during this time, the priesthood had become really corrupt, most of the priests belonged to the sect known as the Sadducees. 
right? You might remember them if you've ever read the Gospels or been around church for a little bit. Jesus is often being questioned and bothered by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were known for being rich and aristocratic men. They didn't believe the entire Old Testament. Uh, They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels or demons. And politically, they were very closely aligned with the Romans because they were very concerned about keeping their prestigious positions of authority as priests. And they're going to be some of the most avid opponents of Jesus when he starts his ministry about 30 years from now. For example, the high priest, that's the the top priest, Caiaphas, is primarily responsible for getting the Romans to crucify Jesus. But we're also told, however, that Zechariah, even though he's a priest, he wasn't like all of these other priests, right? Because in verse 6, it tells us that both he and his wife Elizabeth are righteous in the sight of God, and that they follow the law just like God had commanded them under the old covenant. And even though Zechariah and Elizabeth are godly people, though, they have a problem, right? We were told that they're childless, and that they had tried for years and years to have a child, but they were unable to. And we're told that now they are both very old. And that's important because it means they're, they're past the age when humans can physically have children. And you might be like, yeah, that's kind of sad. But uh, it's even more sad when you take into account the first century culture around children. See, having children was seen as a major societal and even religious expectation. See, living in the promised land, it was extremely important to be able to pass on your land to your descendants, to keep it within the family. And without children, that wasn't really possible. And it was even worse for Elizabeth, his wife, because in the first century Jewish culture, they put such a high expectation and value on being a good mother that women without children were basically shunned from society. So they were righteous. They were do, been doing everything that God asked them to do. But they were daily dealing with this pain and stigma of not having children in this culture. And this had been going on, y'all, for over 60 years. So let's read on then and see what happens to Zechariah. So jumping back into verse 8. Once... When Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot. That's like first century dice that they used. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the law uh, of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were outside praying. Okay, so we get this this brief account of Zechariah's workday. Um, but this isn't an or- as ordinary as it seems to us when reading this, right? We're told that Zechariah was chosen specifically to do the job of burning incense in the temple. This was considered for priests the highest honor that any priest other than the high priest could do. It was such a high honor that the priests were only allowed to burn incense one time in their entire life, right? So this was a a once-in-a-lifetime experience for Zechariah. But why was burning incense so important? What was the big deal? Well, who was with us last Christmas when we did uh, this series called The Gifts of the Magi? Y'all remember that? And we talked about those gifts that the wise men had brought, right? Uh, And if you were there on the night that I talked about frankincense, uh, we learned that frankincense was part of the holy formula for incense that God had commanded the priests to offer twice daily in the temple. And they offered it in the holy place in the temple. So put up this picture that shows the holy place. everything okay all right 
So inside of the temple was this small room called the holy place, right? And inside of that, beyond this uh, curtain that you see in the back, was a place called the Holy of Holies or the Most Holy Place, and that was where the Ark of the Covenant was. But outside of that was this room here, right? Um, and this is where uh, uh, the altar of incense would be. And most importantly, we learn that the burning of incense on this altar, right in front of the presence of God, was meant to represent intercessory prayer. Praying, going up to God like the smoke of the incense, as the priest would offer up prayers for the people on their behalf. All right, so let's read on further and see what happens next. In verse 11... As he was in there offering up the incense, something happened. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call him John. So on this most important day of Zechariah's life as a priest... His once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get to offer up incense and pray as close as possible to the direct presence of God behind the veil. He was all in there by himself in the holy place. He would have lit the incense and made sure that it was burning good so that the smoke was coming up just like it was supposed to. He would have bowed down here to pray. And then he would have got up and slowly backed out as he prayed out of the holy place and joined the rest of the worshipers outside who weren't allowed in. But while he's doing that, something amazing happens, right? We see suddenly an angel appears, who we'll see in a few verses, this angel has a name. His name is Gabriel. And this is very special, because only two names, uh, only two angels are named ever in the Bible. Gabriel and another guy, Michael, that we don't have time to talk about. And interestingly, we're, we're given this like specific location that Gabriel appears. Said that he was standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So go back to our, our picture. So if you're looking at the altar of incense, which is in the back, right? You see on the left, there's this golden menorah, this golden giant golden uh, lampstand. And on the right side is this weird looking gold covered table that has some round things on it, all right? This is called the table of showbread. And we're told the angel appears right between the table of showbread and the altar of incense. And you might be like, okay, big deal, right? Like, what's, what's the deal with the table of showbread, right? Well, it's got 12 loaves of bread on it in two stacks that represent the 12 tribes of Israel, and this was made specially by the priests, and only the priests could eat it, and they could only eat it inside of the holy place, in the Lord's presence there. That's why it was called showbread, or another translation is the bread of the presence, because it constantly stayed in the presence of God. And it was on this table, and the table and the bread then represents this invitation for the priests as representatives of the people, to share a meal with God himself. Sounds a lot like our At the Table series, right, that we just wrapped up. So why does all this matter? Well, look at what this angel says, right? As he's standing in this specific spot between the representation of prayer and the representation of communion with God, the angel tells Zechariah, your prayer has been heard, and you will have a child. Remember, Zechariah and his wife, they had been longing and hoping and praying for a child for over 60 years, and we're told God has heard this prayer. But look again, it's so much more than just an answer to Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayer that they would get a child, right? That would be good enough. But look what Gabriel tells Zechariah about who this child would be. So go with me to verse 14. 
So this is Gabriel still speaking, talking about, you'll have a son, his name is John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or any fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So not only will he be a joy and a delight to Zechariah and Elizabeth, it was just that, it would be enough, right? But no, it's more, because this is the start of God answering not just Zechariah's prayer, but the prayers of all of the Israelites, right? That's why in verse 14 it says, he will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. Not just Zechariah and Elizabeth, but the whole nation of Israel. And why? Well, look at verse 17. The child will be on a mission directly from God, and it says he'll be in the spirit and the power of Elijah to get the people ready for the Lord. So to us non-Israelites, right, not schooled in the, the Old Testament and what this was pointing at, this may not make any sense. Who is this Elijah? What does this mean? Well, this here is a direct and extremely clear fulfillment of one of the most important and most well-known prophecies about when the Messiah would come and deliver Israel. See, the prophet Malachi says that right before the Messiah comes, in Malachi 3, when he says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come. And then later in Malachi 4, he says this, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, just like what we just said. So this is a massive, massively important, right? Because Gabriel tells Zechariah, not only has God answered your prayer for a child, but he is also answering the prayers of all of the people by sending the person who will come and prepare the way for the Messiah to come and deliver Israel and the entire world, right? That is God's promise to Zechariah. Great, right? So Zechariah, he must be like super pumped, right? Because God has answered this prayer, and it's even more than he could have imagined, well, let's read on, right? So go, let's go back to, to Luke 1, verse 18. It says this. So after the angel Gabriel says all of this, Zechariah asked the angel, yeah, how can I be sure of this, right? Like, I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Guys, don't ever say that about your wives. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent here to speak with you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So, so rather than believing God's promise, Zechariah reacted like probably a lot of us would, right? He's like, yeah, but how, how can this actually happen? Right, yeah, because me and my wife... We're both way too old to have children. He's saying here, right, I can't understand how this is humanly possible, right? I can't wrap my head around this. Y'all, that's, that's the point, right? When we pray and we ask God for something, God isn't limited by what is humanly possible. That's the great thing about God is he's not human. He's never limited by what we can understand or even imagine to be true. 
And God makes this clear for us in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah 55, it says this, the Lord speaking, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are, my, are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So God is saying to us, yeah, you can't understand how this is going to work, right? Because I'm God, and you aren't, and you don't think like me, right? I'm not constrained by the limitations that humans are, and I have a much bigger plan than you can ever even imagine. So when Zechariah says, yeah, but how can I be sure of what you're saying? We see Gabriel, I don't know if he was mad. It seemed kind of mad, right? He's like, brah, look at me. I'm an angel. I stand in the presence of God. I just appeared to you out of thin air. What, what more do you want? And then Gabriel tells Zechariah, okay, you want a sign about how you know, can know if this is going to be true or not? Here's your sign. You're going to be mute until you actually see with your eyes that God answers prayers and keeps his promises. So Gabriel disappears, and Zechariah finally comes out of the holy place. He's been in there for much longer than normal, and all the people outside are wondering what's going on. But he can't tell them because he's unable to speak. So they know something major have happened. And spoiler alert, uh, Elizabeth becomes pregnant, just like Gabriel said. So let's read on and see what happens. Verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, Nope, he's to be called John. And they said to her, No one among your uh, your relatives has that name? Then they made signs to his father to find out what he thought they should name the child. And he asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, And he, Zechariah, began to speak, praising God. So, even though Zechariah hadn't believed, even when Gabriel the angel appears to him, his lack of faith here didn't stop God from keeping his promises. And y'all, this is good news for us too, right? Because how many times have we question whether God could do something, right? Sometimes I even find myself while I'm actually praying for something, not really believing that God would answer my prayer. Have y'all been there? Or sometimes even when I get an answer to my prayer, I'm like, yeah, but did God really do that or is, did it just happen? Because just like Zachariah, I sometimes have trouble understanding how something could happen. And y'all, this happened to me just a few months ago. Uh, In August of this year, right before the start of the semester, see, I had this linguistics class. I'm a linguistics professor, if we haven't talked about that before. Uh, I had this class that I love teaching, and I was was pumped about it, but because of the COVID years, the English department um, is down on juniors and seniors right now, who would be taking this class. And so the class didn't have enough students in it signed up for it to actually run. And that meant that I wasn't going to get to teach this class that I love, but it's even worse because usually when a class gets canceled at the last minute, that means I have to teach a class that I absolutely hate. It's freshman composition, right? If, if you're a senior here, or you're, if you're a... If you're in college right now, you may be taking this class and hate it just as much as I do. So I had been praying from the end of the spring semester of last year, all through the summer, that God would let this class make. Because 
And, and because it had taken so long, right? I watched the whole spring semester end and no one more signed up. I watched the summer go by hoping, you know, we get some new students. No one signed up. Because nothing had changed. Just like Zachariah, after 60 years, he had just basically given up. I, I had just given up because I thought there's no way in my own understanding, right? Because my faith in God was limited by my own understanding. But about three weeks before the start of the semester, my department chair comes to me and she asked me to, if I would be willing to take on this class, the senior capstone class, which I'd always wanted to teach. <laughs> it's even more fun and even more easy for me to teach than the class that I had gotten canceled. So y'all, even though I didn't have faith in God, he still answered my prayer. When I thought there was no way that it could happen, and just like Zechariah, he actually answered my prayer in an even better way than I had been asking. So the good news is that, that while God wants for us to believe in him in faith, and, and it's, in the Bible it says without faith it's impossible to please God, but that doesn't mean God is limited. God isn't limited by anything, even our faith in him to do what he said he would do. So, wrapping up, uh, when Zechariah was able to declare in writing that what Gabriel had told him, that the baby will be John, and he's given back his speech, Zechariah immediately begins to praise God, right? And y'all, that's what we are called to do. When God answers our prayer, we are called to give him glory for it, right? Right? Because just like Zechariah and Elizabeth, God's promises are always a means for God to get the glory. And when we see his promises come fulfilled in our lives, it's up to us to give God the glory for that. Even if we didn't have the faith to fully believe that God would hear our prayers like Zechariah, we can still give God the glory for his faithfulness when we see it. His faithfulness. He isn't dependent on our thinking and our abilities or even our faith to believe in him. And we don't have time to look at it tonight, but the rest of this chapter is called Zechariah's Song, right? And Zechariah was overcome with joy right here, so much so that he prophesies through song, looking forward to what his baby John will do. He's going to grow up and become John the Baptist, who you may have heard about, who prepares the way for Jesus to come. And so just look at this in Luke 1, 76. It says this, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare a way from him, to give the people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. See, Zechariah here, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, makes it clear that this will be a spiritual Messiah, and he will bring about salvation through the forgiveness of sin, something that no priest like Zechariah had ever been able to do under the Old Covenant. So Zechariah's song here points us towards the coming of Jesus and the implementation of the New Covenant, which Tom discussed last week at the end of our At the Table series. So as I end tonight, I want to ask you, what, what have you been praying for? Maybe you've got a sick parent. Maybe you've been praying for God to bring you some friends who will actually understand who you are. Maybe you've been praying for guidance on something, like where to go to college or what to do with the rest of your life. Whatever it is, I want you to take a lesson from Zachariah's experience that God hears your prayers. God knows exactly what you want, but more importantly, God knows exactly what you need. 
Because you have to remember, God's plan is so much bigger than we could ever see. And in everything, he is working for your good, as Romans 8, 28 says. But we just not be able to see from our perspective the whole plan right now about how could this be good. And all that we have to do as we wait on God in his perfect timing is one, trust God and have faith in his plans, not like Zechariah, because we can't understand God's ways because he doesn't think like us. And then the second thing, when God does answer your prayer, to give him the glory for it. And know that God's answers to our problems and desires are much bigger than we could ever uh, imagine. Because Zechariah thought he was just praying for a child. But God chose to give him not only a child, but the child that would bring an entire nation to the place that they were finally ready for the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to bring salvation and true forgiveness of sin, something that the people had been waiting for thousands of years to happen. Dear God, we, we thank you that you hear our prayers. God, and I thank you that, that you're not limited by anything, but especially that you're not limited by us and our, our, our terrible willingness to believe you will do what you say you will do. God, please be with these students tonight as they're, they're struggling with things. I know in a crowd this size, there's tons of people struggling with pain, things that they've been praying about, things that they've been worried about for, for years, for most of their life.